maybe because of the time, let's start today's special seminar. We usually have a Tuesday seminars jointly done by Institute of Biomedical Engineering uh, and Center for Life Sciences Technologies and Istanbul Health Industry Cluster every Tuesday at one. Today is a special seminar because we want to bring several interdisciplinary groups next in the next uh, four weeks, including this one. So therefore we started a little bit early. So we are recording this one for people who are coming late. Maybe you are watching it on the video. Uh, I, because of time constraints, uh, I will leave the floor to Professor Yuja Soy to give the perspective of this talk in reference to the Neurotech EU project and some of our capacity building activities. Floor is yours, Professor Yuja Soy. Great, thanks very much, James Sanjan. Well, I mean, I don't want to take too much time because time is very valuable, but we have very valuable uh, guest speakers with us. So that's that's really, truly uh, very nice. Uh, we have Sema Hoca, Ali Emre Hoca, I think, uh, Arda Hoca, Tuna Hoca, Birkan Hoca, and Cansu Hoca with us. Uh, they are going to share their um, research, cutting edge research actually in molecular communication, essentially. And then this is going to be uh, a basis for our discussion, uh, which will follow that, uh, for our um, joint project, uh, possibly TÜBİTAK BİNDÖRT project. And we are doing this as a Neurotech EU, uh, NEURICO and NEUROFUND uh, Work Package 5 uh, joint uh, act activity as well, because it's actually really uh, fitting into that. We are now doing uh, active, um, capacity building and matchmaking. These were the uh, the things that we were planning to do in Neurotech EU in our Boğaziçi University function. So I think this is an excellent uh, opportunity to do just those as well. I won't talk to any further. I uh, will to now just be the first uh, to talk. So I will leave the floor to you. Thanks to everyone participating. Uh, hello to everyone. Uh, so. Uh, We'll be uh, present, making the presentation uh, by three different professors. Uh, so I will take the first part. Uh, my part will be in number of slides longer, but I will uh, try to be as fast as possible. So I will not go into too much details. If there are any uh, details you would like to ask, uh, we can discuss all those later. So uh, today we will be introducing our uh, research uh, related to uh, molecular communications and uh, together with that, it's uh, physical implementations uh, in in body sensing uh, at Walsh University. Uh, so the agenda is: I'll first introduce the team, then give a brief summary of uh, molecular communications, and uh, discuss uh, our previous work related to molecular communications and in body sensing. Uh, the team is composed of uh, is. Uh, already has been mentioned, uh, of six professors. Uh, we're also, uh, we've started uh, actively collaborating also with a professor, uh, Kutlu Ulyan uh, from uh, chemical engineering also recently. Uh, so uh, the uh, people you see in the first row are, the first one is me. Uh, Ali Emre Hoca is not here today uh, and uh, Virkan Hoca is here. The three of us, uh, uh, are uh, people that are mostly doing theoretical work, uh, not uh, hands-on uh, parts. Uh, that part is uh, handled and provided by uh, Professor Arda Denzi Alcinkaya from uh, the double E department, uh, Sema Dumanlı Oktar, who is also from the double E department in our university, and Cansu Canbek uh, Özdil, who uh, is uh, just uh, starting as a very young professor at uh, Yedisepe University. Uh, among the others, the first three were uh, myself and Birkan are from the computer engineering department and Ali Emre Tusani is also from the uh, WE department at Walsh University. Uh, sorry. So very briefly, what is nano-networking? Nano and from there, we will come to molecular communications. First of all, about the nanomachines. Typically, a nanomachine uh, is a device uh, which has some uh, components at the nanoscale. And of course, it's supposed to be doing some useful function as a, a machine. Uh, that machine could be a human-made machine, 
or an engineered uh, cell, or it may be a combination of these. From our perspective, the important things are at least one of the dimensions should be uh, in the nano scale. That's a requirement of being uh, called a nano networking device uh, by the IEEE uh, P1906.1 standard group. Uh, it should be uh, human controlled, otherwise all living cells are actually uh, satisfying the first uh, rule. Uh, it should be able to process data and be uh, capable of communicating by utilize, utilizing some carriers of information at the nanoscale. Uh, the standard group uh, of which I'm a member uh, defines the nanoscale as 100 nanometers or below. At least one of the dimensions should be at 100 nanometers or below. Uh, other dimensions could be larger. So this actually uh, we gave this flexibility to allow for uh, devices that could work also as uh, gateways between the nanoscale and higher scales. So uh, nanomachines, of course, should be uh, able to do some useful work, but they have limited processing power, sensing capabilities, communication range, sensing is also uh, could be done only at a uh, limited range, uh, and of course, uh, limited capacity, limited energy. So that means a single nanomachine typically would not be useful. So we need a network of nanomachines, then that requires communication between those machines in that nano network. So that uh, there are two approaches in the literature for uh, solving this communication uh, dilemma. Uh, one is uh, electromagnetic communications at the terahertz uh, uh, frequencies. And the other is molecular communications. That means communications by making use of molecules. That's what we're focused at. So uh, though we use the title non-networking, we're specifically talking about the molecule, uh, molecular communications implementation of uh, non-networking. And as I said, there is an IEEE standard group that's working on the standardization of the work in, uh, in general in non-networking. But again, the focus of the uh, standard group is also mostly molecular communications because that appears to be more viable. Uh, at the, uh, there are some test beds uh, that have been developed as proof of concept at the macro scale and uh, also at the micro scale. Uh, the one on the top uh, you see uh, was initially uh, based on the uh, sensors produced by Andrew Eckford uh, from York University in Canada. And uh, the overall testbed uh, was published in the uh, UN ICC paper. Uh, we, are, uh, we have a copy of this uh, testbed actually uh, in our lab in Candile. Uh, but we are also working on some micro scale testbeds as we're going to discuss soon. So what have uh, we done up to now and what are we currently focused on? Uh, first of all, we defined the, uh, now the work I'm going to explain here, by the way, is the theoretical side that was mostly done by uh, Ali Emre Pusane, Birkan Yilmaz and uh, myself. Uh, later, uh, Jansu and Sema will be talking uh, on the, uh, real implementations uh, based on uh, sensing and others. So uh, as I said, my explanation will be mostly focused on theoretical work. So we first defined the uh, energy model for molecular communication via diffusion. Uh, this is how we call it in the uh, non-networking world. Uh, we uh, designed some uh, different modulation techniques for transmitting data, how you can transmit information uh, by making use of uh, diffusion, uh, by making use of molecules that are diffusing in the environment. Uh, we also uh, defined how uh, you can form data frames by uh, making use of molecules. We looked at how calcium signaling is done uh, between cells. And uh, one important thing, I'm going to discuss this in more detail later, but uh, we looked at pre-equalization and ISI intersymbol interference mitigation, that's the major problem 
in nano networking, how we can solve ISI. So we came up with some pre equalization approaches for that. Uh, we also looked at uh, the analytical formulation of uh, the 3D channel characteristics uh, when we have uh, an absorbing receiver. And we also defined the achievable uh, rate analysis for uh, diffusion. Uh, we looked at uh, network coding uh, for communication via diffusion uh, and also position based modulation. And we also uh, defined uh, how a partial receiving counting absorbing receiver could be done and then uh, also make use of uh, optimal reception delay again to uh, reduce uh, intersymbol interference. Uh, and we also developed some simulation uh, methods and uh, open source libraries like uh, the high level architecture and uh, GPU programming. Uh, we looked at uh, index modulation uh, with Arturul Bashar uh, from Koch University. Uh, we applied index modulation. Index modulation is already being used in uh, electromagnetic communications, but we were the first to apply it to molecular communications. And uh, we also had a joint project with uh, South Korea with Professor Che of Yonsei University in South Korea uh, on uh, communication in vessel-like like blood vessels, uh, vessel-like environments, how communication uh, and detection also could be done in such environments. Uh, so uh, as I said, all things uh, I uh, very fast uh, went over here are mostly uh, theoretical work uh, uh, that we have done thus far. Uh, we, uh, we currently have an ongoing Tibetan uh, 1001 uh, national project on colorimetric analysis. Uh, we have a molecular signal uh, and source localization for underwater and medical applications. That's the uh, project of Bilkan Yilmaz, if you're interested in that, uh, Bilkan can answer your questions in more detail. So let me very briefly talk about this molecular communication by diffusion, what it is and what are the problems there and how we're uh, trying to overcome those problems. So the problem is Newtonian physics doesn't work, as you know, at the nanoscale. The inertial forces are not uh, that much effective anymore, and we cannot shoot or uh, throw a messenger molecule towards some destination, you just release it to the environment and start praying. Uh, hopefully, uh, with diffusion, uh, those messenger molecules will arrive at the uh, intended destination or the intended uh, receiver. So that means you're making use of Brownian motion. So the molecules you release, hopefully with uh, diffusion, will arrive at the receiver. But the probability that this will arrive in time is very low. Therefore, what you do is you release many of these molecules. These will take different paths. Some will arrive early. Some will arrive late. Some will never arrive in uh, three dimensions. And some will arrive extremely late. This red one here is so late that, as you will see now, it causes some problems. The implication of this de delay is that when you release molecules from the source cell, for example, to some destination cell, most of the molecules will uh, go in almost line of sight paths and arrive early. That's why at the receiver side, if you look at the uh, number of arriving molecules, it increases steeply in the beginning. But unfortunately, there are also many molecules, there are stray molecules that uh, remain in the uh, environment, and they're taking the long path, as we've seen in the previous uh, animation, and they will be arriving too late. So the right tail uh, of this distribution is a very slow decaying uh, tail. So what happens when you have, now this is for a single bit of information, a one or a zero, that's how you send it. If you want to send, and of course you want to send a sequence of bits, the problem is the second, uh, for the second bit, if we uh, plot that with a green curve, uh, there will be too much overlap 
this yellow shaded area, which is called the intersymbol interference. These are the molecules that belong to the previous bit, the one that was shown with the red distribution, but they arrived at the time duration of the second bit. That's why it's called interference. The uh, stay molecules, delayed molecules from the previous bit are causing a misunderstanding for the following follow-up bits. So this ISI uh, intersymbol interference is the main problem in the non-networking world and almost everything you will find will be trying to somehow uh, solve this problem. So uh, the problem gets even worse. Now that was a very simple scenario. One transmitter, one receiver. What if there are also other transmitters and receivers in the environment that are using the same uh, type of messenger molecules? The problem becomes even more complex in that case. So if we look at the uh, number of received molecules at the destination, it will be typically composed of uh, the terms you see here, which are basically the intended uh, molecules, number of molecules that were received at the correct time, and the ones, unfortunately, that were uh, incorrectly received during that time. So uh, this is these are the things, actually, that are causing either intersymbol interference or co-channel interference. It's like if you have two pairs communicating with each other, this one is supposed to talk to this one, but unfortunately, this one receives it. So that's what we call the co-channel interference. So these are typical problems we need to uh, deal with. So co-channel interference, as I said, has a very detrimental uh, effect in molecular communications. It depends on distance and the, the distance between the pairs and also distance between the uh, transmitter and the receiver. So how can we cope with the intersymbol interference? One solution is you put the symbols too far apart so that you uh, decrease the amount of overlap here, which is the intersymbol interference. So if this blue curve was more to the left, there would be more intersymbol interference. Take it all the way to the right, then you will decrease uh, intersymbol interference. But that means you're transmitting even at a lower rate, which is something, of course, the commutation engineers do not want to do. One other solution could be you could shape the signal. Rather than having that signal have a very long, slow decaying right tail, make the fast decaying right tail, if you can manage that. If you can do that, then you can have consecutive symbols coming one after another. So that means you increase your data rate. But now the problem is how you shape that signal. So one solution could be uh, you destroy the stray molecules, which is not easy to do, or you try to be more clever. And what we proposed here was, for example, we transmit yet another signal. So Actually, we want to send A, but we send another signal B, which cannot destroy A molecules, but the receiver makes a subtraction and uh, subtracts the B signal from A. So the resulting signal would be Z, which has a fast decaying right tail as uh, compared to uh, the uh, A distribution. How we implement this is yet another problem. Uh, currently, we're working on that uh, uh, professor uh, that's working on synthetic biology. But again, that's a completely uh, theoretical and simulated work. Uh, one other thing I mentioned earlier was index modulation in molecular communication uh, via diffusion. This is used in uh, the emerging uh, virus communication systems. Like you have multiple antennas that are transmitting and receiving, like. Uh, Normally, we try to transmit uh, the signal, the electromagnetic signal, and based on some feature of the electromagnetic signal, like the amplitude, phase, frequency, whatever, you uh, modulate the information. This time also, the antenna index, the number of the antenna from which you're transmitting, that also contains some information. Like if you have eight transmitter and eight receiver antennas, and you understand let's say you transmit it from the third antenna, that's even three bits of information itself. And the information you transmitted, that's another bit. So in total, you have transmitted four bits in one single duration. 
Uh, another approach would be uh, carrying the information at the time of the transmission. So you send a spike, actually, you send a pulse. When you send the pulse, could be the information itself. So if you want to send a zero, you send it uh, at this point. If you want to send a one, you send it at a different time. Uh, when we do transmissions, when we do communications, unfortunately, there is a lot of uh, error in the communication. So typically, we have error correcting codes uh, in communication. So coding is a very important uh, part of communications in classical communications. And typically, we make use of the Hamming codes and uh, look at the Hamming distance. Uh, however, Hamming distance does not work when we talk about molecular communications because we're not using the uh, electromagnetic signals here. Uh, for this, we have uh, designed the inter uh, symbol interference minimizing uh, error control codes. Uh, now, remember that uh, ISI uh, figures, we said the overlap was the major problem. So one approach we proposed was, what if we don't start counting at the beginning where we have a lot of interference and start the counting later? But then the question is, when? When do you start counting? How much time you skip that tell time? So uh, we looked at how we can optimize that reception delay and uh, coined the term signal to interference uh, difference rather than signal to interference ratio, which is a better uh, parameter for molecular communications world. Uh, the intersymbol uh, inter interference is mostly due to the molecules that are uh, remaining in the environment. And typically, they arrive on the other side. Because they are taking the longer path, they mostly arrive on the other side of the receiver. So we'll uh, look at what happens if you just start counting on one side, on the intended side of the receiver, and ignore the rest. So we uh, came up with the partially receiving absorbing receivers. And uh, the, uh, for the 3D channel, uh, the characteristics of the uh, 3D channel were not, uh, actually still not uh, uh, known analytically. So what we did was we came up uh, with the definition of two quite complex, one with five, the other one with six uh, parameters, uh, new distributions that represent uh, the uh, channel behavior much better than the existing uh, probability distributions. But setting the parameters of these distributions is quite complex. So for that, we also developed an uh, ANN uh, network. And uh, the famous Shannon's channel capacity formula, unfortunately, that also doesn't work in molecular communications. So uh, we defined and uh, found the achievable rate analysis for molecular uh, communications world. So in total, our theoretical work, uh, uh, Jansu and Sema will continue on the uh, other side of it, uh, but our theoretical work uh, are basically, we define the first energy model for molecular communications via diffusion. We defined several modulation techniques. Uh, by the way, uh, we started working on molecular communications in 2010 and 11, uh, which is also when the uh, non networking uh, communications society started forming. So we're one of the early bidders. So uh, that's why we also received a lot of hits for these uh, papers, for our early papers. We defined the first uh, frame structure uh, composed of the molecule. Uh, we studied calcium signaling. We look at how we can mitigate ISI basically by pre equalization. We developed the analytical formulation of 3D channel characteristics with absorbing receivers and achievable rate analysis for uh, molecular communication via diffusion. Uh, we developed uh, network coding for MCVD when you have uh, two pairs communicating in between, you can insert a delay node. I didn't explain that, that uh, can extend the communication range. Uh, there we did network coding and also position-based modulation. 
we defined how a partially receiving counting uh, absorbing receiver could be designed. Uh, we did work on uh, how to optimize the reception delay to again reduce uh, intersymbol interference. And for all these, we have uh, developed several uh, libraries and simulators uh, to this end. So my presentation ends here. So I will pass uh, the screen control now to Johnson. So please let me know if you can see my screen and I can continue from here. We can, Perfect. We can see your screen, but you have to go to presentation mode. Oh yeah, sure. Just a second. I think it's going to be easier like this. I think we will delay the most of the questions maybe at the end, unless there are burning questions which needs to immediate clarification. Please go ahead, Jansu. Thank you for the introduction, first of all, <laughs> Professor Tuju. Um, after this theoretical part, I want to introduce you a little bit what we are doing on the, on the work, like experimental work, because as you know, molecular communication, which actually includes the molecules, it needs to be justified experimentally. Up to now, there was a lot of works on the theoretical part, and um, uh, there was like really nice things. But when it comes to experiments, as you know, we have a lot of problems. And I think experimentalists are going to understand what I'm saying. Um, I will introduce you different uh, works that we are conducting in micro and nano engineering to support the molecular communication field. <laughs> to start with the micron range, um, as Professor Tuju showed different uh, models, like different simulations, all of the simulations are actually realized inside the body. So it's like a really small size that you are dealing with when you are uh, trying to count the molecules. So the first thing that uh, needs to be done in this field that creating, creating an environment, closed environment, where you can study diffusion. And for this, microfluidics is an am amazing tool because uh, this tool provides us to control the flow rate, maybe to reduce the ISO to, to play with different parameters to when you're doing an experiment. This tool is uh, also nice because by using microfluidics, we can imitate, we can generate different uh, testing environments. For example, when you, when you want to work molecular communication in a certain part of the human body, you can mimic such geometry directly inside, uh, directly in the microfluidic uh, systems by using like micro, micro range models that you want. And for this, there are different techniques, as you know, to produce like microfluidic systems. Uh, laser ablation is one of them. It's quite a rapid technique. It's really cost effective. So you have you are using only uh, like a laser source. It can be UV laser or carbon dioxide laser. In our case, we are using a carbon dioxide laser to produce a micron range test environment, as you can see here. This method allows us to produce like two channels without any mask or without any low, uh, soft lithography, uh, which actually uh, makes us to like uh, earn more time because with the soft lithography, we are only able to produce channels at a really long time. And by this technique, we can produce micro uh, range channels in 20 minutes and we can have a closed systems. It's quite rapid. <laughs> And here uh, you can see different channels that are produced by using different, actually same parameters, but with different methods. We can change the roughness of a channel by just simple pretreatment process that we are applying. Basically what we have here, we have a PMMA substrate, it's a metacrylate substrate, which we use um, to create the channels. And by using the laser ablation method, we are able to change the roughness depth and the width of our uh, channel. So this allows us to produce uh, different test environments. Uh, let me show you one of them. Uh, this is a simple device by produce, uh, produced by using laser ablation. So we have a micron range channel produced by laser, uh, laser ablation. So we are using polystyrene microbeads as information carriers. They are micron range uh, systems. So what you see on the right, here on the video, we have the polystyrene beads, which are used the number of the polystyrene beads as the information carriers. So the presence of certain threshold number of polystyrene beads means the, we have the information one and the absence is zero. Uh, the red count, let me play again here, is our ROI region, meaning our region of interest. We kept it really short here, so we are using a circle detection algorithm here to count the beads. 
And by extending the Oroi region, you can transfer long uh, sequence bits, such as here is the 14 bits code, uh, which is ASCII letters of uh, Boazic University initials here. We are able to transmit any information effectively by using this method. This is one of our test beds that we are using, for example, when we want to study micro, uh, micro uh, scale uh, information transmission. Uh, let's say. Also, we can use microfluidics for off-body sensing systems. What we mean, what I mean is that when you couple microfluidics by um, SRR in split resonating structures, we can sense any molecule that we want by using by measuring differential differentially. Here is our um, system. What we have here, we have on the left a re reference sensor, which uh, provides the background data, the reference data, and we have a test sensor. In the reference the sensor, we have only one streamline, which we have the DI ultra in this case. And our model molecule here is the glucose. By injecting glucose with the DI water from the second, the middle channel, we are able to measure the concentration of glucose uh, using vector network analyzer. This method actually allows us to have a real-time detection uh, of the molecule of interest. And of course, non-contact measurement is quite important for us to avoid any contamination or maybe increase the sensitivity. Here is the um, reflection spectra of our measurement. Basically, we are able to sense 0.01 molar glucose in the, by this method. But of course, this method is not viable when you want to do in-body sensing because this, uh, this is like a really large-scale sensor that you cannot implement directly inside the body. For this, what we can do is we, instead of doing a differential measurement, we can use nanoparticles as sensing agents. So we have different uh, nanomaterials, like first-generation nanomaterials, we call them, because these materials are not yet uh, biocompatible. This, this has to be um, covered with a biocompatibility, like a, it has to be covered with another agent to induce biocompatibility. That's why we call them first generation nanomaterials. And when they are able to be induced, in, actually implemented inside the human body with, uh, without inducing any toxicity, these nanomaterials are referred as a second generation nanomaterials. And of course, there is another thing which is important to the third generation, which we call stimulator response in nanomaterials, which actually triggers your sensing mechanism. Uh, here, we have different geometry, we have different size on the particles, and all of them can be used, actually different uh, applications that can be used to sense any specific molecule of interest inside the body. What I mean is that, for example, let me show you an example. Gold nanorolls are quite actually most, most common uh, systems that are used for sensing reagents of uh, sensing for glucose. Basically, in the presence of glucose uh, and glucose oxidase, uh, the results of their enzymatic reaction actually induces a peroxide to the environment. And we can use nanoparticles to sense glucose indirectly by measuring the level of ox uh, peroxide in the system. This such kind of nanoparticles can be applied uh, directly inside the body by, of course, uh, doing some modulations, as I said before, and they can be used to uh, as sensing agents or messenger molecules inside the body. And this is what we are doing currently for in-body sensing part. And uh, now I can give the floor to Professor Imanlu for the transmit information from the body to the outside world. I keep it quite short. If you have any questions, just uh, let me know because we don't have too much time. Uh, thanks a lot. So uh, I am interested in hijacking that communication, molecular communication, and sending that information to the outside world. And my talk is going to be about that. Uh, in parallel to that, uh, with Arda Deniz Yalçın Kaya Hoca, uh, we are also uh, working on uh, on-body and in-body sensors. So this is actually um, closely linked. Uh, so how it is linked, I'm going to discuss and on behalf of everyone I'm going to be talking uh, John Soja, Arda Hoca and also uh, we have a collaborator at Bikant University Urartu Özgür Şafak Şeker Hoca. Uh, so uh, here is the link we as you have been listening to Tuna Hoca uh, that we we are envisaging there is a molecular link and there's information that's uh, sent over that link and at some point obviously this information should be sent uh, to outside uh, world. And we are aiming to use a conventional electromagnetic uh, link 
uh, in order to do that. Uh, and we are working on two different approaches as um, what kind of an implantable device can be used to uh, achieve that um, target. Uh, so the first one, we have two different approaches. One is an active uh, approach. When I say active, I mean uh, using a battery and a more conventional electronic device inside the human body. That's an active implant. And also another approach would be a passive implant where we don't have um, an, uh, a battery. It's just a reflector that we are locating inside the human body. And um, we are envisaging that that particular passive implant is going to be uh, degrading in time and finally we are not going to be needing a second operation in order to take that implant outside the human body um, so briefly i'm going to discuss these two different approaches uh, and i would like to draw your attention to the fact that here uh, we are actually using engineered bacteria and uh, the engineering bacteria senses the molecule of, of interest and once it is sensed that sensing is going to be sent by our implants, passive or active, to the outside world. And by doing so, we are kind of pushing the sensing bit to a more intelligent uh, device, a living cell, obviously, rather than using electronic device sensors to do that. Uh, but um, forming that link is not that easy. So in the first active implant, what we have done uh, is that we have an, a bioluminescent bacteria that starts uh, luminescing uh, once uh, it senses a molecule of interest. Now envisage that this molecule of interest is uh, the molecule that is used in the molecular communication system that we have been discussing up until now. And once that molecule is present, the bacteria starts responding and we are supposed to be obviously sensing that. Um, and we use a photodiode in order to sense this luminescence and sense that data in a conventional method. It's a much smaller electronic device that we are locating inside the human body, uh, but sense it and send this information to the outside world uh, using in-body communications. Um, and in the, uh, in the second approach where we are uh, aiming to use a passive uh, device, there we are investigating a bio, the correlation between biodegradation and uh, the molecule of interest. So this is an interesting approach that we would like to know if there exists a molecule of interest in the molecular communication, right? And if we can somehow change the degradation speed as we receive that molecule, uh, then can we actually track that wirelessly from outside the human body? That's the question that we are asking to ourselves. First things first, of course, we are trying to understand if we can do that using, again, uh, bacteria. Uh, and if he, here you can see how uh, the degradation speed changes if we have in uh, an E. coli bacteria inside the um, medium. And we have been experimenting with this a bit more. Uh, and what we think that this is, uh, these samples are manufactured using magnesium sputtering. And we are envisaging that we're going to be having uh, implanted resonators. And these resonators can be uh, reflector antennas or it can be a cellular, as you can see here. Um, imagine before the degradation and after the degradation, we have two different stages, right? And if these two different stages and the interaction of on body reader antennas with these implantable devices changes, as this degradation proceeds, this can be tracked from outside the human body. As you can see, this is the transmission coefficient. This is what, what this graph tells you is that when you excite the first port, what do you receive from the second port? And checking that I can track from outside the human body that my implant is degrading. And if this degradation speed can be linked to the arrival of molecule of interest, then voila, we can actually uh, uh, monitor uh, or hijack the molecular communication 
uh, somehow. Uh, so for this, uh, we are working on uh, different on-body reader uh, designs, uh, different implants, uh, structures and degradation methods. Uh, also, as I said, uh, we are closely working with uh, Bilkent University to, um, to play with the engineered uh, SAS, really. So it is, it is a, a long story, um, and I think videos tell lots of good stuff. That's why I always add videos and photos in my presentations here. You can see the degradation speed video uh, as we are using different uh, bacteria. In the start, you can see the speed difference in speed, and then towards the end, it changes. So we are trying to kind of engineer this and we are trying to engineer the speed of degradation um, as a certain molecule of interest um, arrives in there. Um, so these are the two approaches that we are using in order to um, hijack this molecular communication. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's a little bit uh, high level and if you have any questions I am here to answer I didn't want to go into details of all this it's a bit um, too much I, I I was afraid so yeah I am here to answer your questions great thanks very much Jengis Sanojan please take over and uh, so I mean it, I think no one still... else can do it better than you do I'm sorry Sanojan I couldn't hear is, no, there is a de yeah, delay please, probably moderate. Uh, moderate the questions. Okay, now we have unlimited minutes. Thank God. <laughs> as soon as I started to see uh, it. Finished. <laughs> yeah. Once this, yeah. Fin so everything is finished now. Minutes. We have them. Uh, yeah. Right. Like the. Okay, but uh, we can uh, ask questions about all these speakers. I know uh, uh, Tunoja has to leave uh, soon. Uh, the topic was more on what has been done. The chair the uh, research, coordinated research of several laboratories uh, together. Uh, are there any uh, additional uh, uh, speakers want to comment from the group? I know there are additional faculty members from the group uh, uh, participating. They are not necessarily uh, presenting today, but uh, we, there are six uh, faculty members uh, from the group. If Birkan Hoja or I don't see the full uh, screens here, okay. but I want to add a few comments, maybe we can take them first and then go for questions about any of the three speakers. In right. more and detail. Esin Hoja already has a uh, question, it appears. Esin Hoja, why don't we start with your question? Okay, thank you for these great presentations. I truly enjoyed it. Uh, my first question is to Sema Hoja. So, um, Sema Hoja, do you use um, MG stands for magnesium or what do you use on those sensors is my first question. And the second is, do you implant these and then sense them while inside the body or uh, what level is uh, the work at now? I, I wasn't sure about that. So are these implantable already? Thanks a lot. Thank you uh, for the question, Esnojan. Um, first of all, yes, they are magnesium. And at the moment, we are not locating them inside the human body, uh, but we are picking, of course, biodegradable and biocompatible materials because that's our target to locate them inside the human body. We are using mediums that are mimicking uh, human body conditions. We uh, experiment in uh, minimal media, uh, we experiment in serum, we experiment in various mediums at the moment, but it's outside the human body. However, uh, when we try to do wireless sensing, tracking, wireless tracking, uh, we use um, uh, phantoms. Uh, to do the wireless communication bit. So there are two different lines, lines of work here. Of course, first, uh, one line, we are investigating the correlation between degradation and uh, the um, bacteria. And in another line, we are working on trying to read wirelessly what is happening inside the human body using on-body readers. 
And in the second line, we are using phantoms that are mimicking muscle, brain, um, whatever tissue we, we uh, generate them in, in our lab. Uh, and uh, we also prototype our antennas, uh, flexible antennas, and also uh, rigid antennas inside our lab again. Uh, again, not inside the human body, Phantoms are mediums that are mimicking human body, electromagnetically mimicking human body. Um, so as I said, there are two different mediums. One is biologically mimicking the human body. In the second line where we are doing the sensing, that is electromagnetically mimicking the human body. Uh, really cool. Um, can I follow up with one more question? Sure. Uh, does it have to be magnesium? So can it be some like nanoparticle that might even you know, be uh, hopefully seen under MRI. You know, I just want to connect it to my body. Yeah, Sorry sure, <laughs> sure. Uh, I actually, we have been discussing this a lot. Uh, there are so many different opportunities that is lying ahead of us, and we are excited, of course, but at the same time, we, we are only, you know, a number of people, you know, we don't have the enough um, energy and time for doing all of this stuff. Uh, but yes, absolutely. I mean, maybe Jan Suhoja would like to comment on that, our discussions, how we can actually incorporate nanoparticles as well uh, into this work. Uh, but there, there are, of course, uh, various different approaches uh, to, the sim to, to the same problem. Okay, thanks. Uh, just to give an information, yes, it is possible to do it with the nanoparticles, of course. Uh, but again, the thing is, when you're using the nanoparticles, the problem is the toxicity. As you know, when they're going to degrade, it's going to be uh, um, expelled from the body. So it has to be, uh, we have to be careful about that. So we have to be at certain size and certain uh, surface chemistry. We have some proposals for this, uh, but of course the thing is it has to be a conductor since you're working with electromagnetic waves. So we have to use some nanoparticles which are assembled like self-assembly. So it has to be like a continuous uh, and perfect organization to have the, the response that we want. But of course there is uh, a lot of works on this, but we are thinking about it as Samoja presented. Yeah. And of course, I am always complaining about the conductivity of those nanoparticles. They are not enough for me. I want more conductivity all the time. <laughs> that's, that's that is one of the drawbacks. I, mean, I guess it comes with the territory uh, yeah. because of the, your background in electrical engineering. Everything has to be conductive <laughs> very fast. Uh, Panoja, you have a question? Yes, thank you very much. First of all, for this all nice talks to uh, uh, all of the uh, um, uh, all of you, and um, I would like to maybe continue first commenting on the nanoparticle side. Uh, uh, so uh, maybe uh, I can help with you that as well, so we can produce some nanocapsules, put those uh, uh, toxic uh, inorganic nanoparticles inside of it, and then use it uh, uh, for the final purpose. That could be also something that maybe we can collaborate on that. Uh, and we can tune more advanced, more uh, uh, yeah, um, non-toxic uh, nanomaterials all together. So because I know also uh, uh, from my own expertise, it's not uh, easy to design all these nanomaterials in, uh, in an optimized way. Uh, you have to think so many things. Um, so maybe first uh, I would like to ask a question also, John Soja, in regard to that. So you showed nice gold nanoparticle, the gold nanorod to use. Do you have? Do you use any other type of nanoparticles? Because you showed different shapes. Uh, uh, there was one slide uh, which you mentioned. Um, any other types? Maybe soft nanoparticles as well. Um, actually, yeah, we are working, basically I'm working with metallic nanoparticles, so that's what our experience we're doing, like by experience we were using metallic nanoparticles to have the conductivity that value we want, that was one of the yeah. things that that's especially that's why we were working with metallic nanoparticles first of all. Uh, magnetite is another option, but of course it's like uh, when you're working with the magnetites, as you know, like uh, yeah, first of all, the response is not going to be the same, and I don't think we're going to be enough for Stema, which has a uh, vicious good conductivity, first of all. <laughs> that is one of the problems that we have. Uh, apart from gold, silver, and platinum, that I uh, show you some examples, uh, we have silicon nanoparticles, the dielectric environments, we are using core shell systems. 
And yeah, and uh, some mesoporous hollow structures that I showed as the carriers, because the idea is actually, as you know, to have the stimuli responsive nanoparticle when we have the molecule of interest that we want to sense. When it comes to it can release the information as the time of the, um, the um, arrival. So we're working different things. And the idea now is um, currently, we are investigating with Janus type nanoparticles that I'm really quite interested about them because you have a bi-response that you can use different systems at the same time. For now, we are trying to evolve the direction that we want, but uh, we are open to, of course, discover new possibilities for sure. Yeah, thank you very much. I think, yeah, so uh, maybe time is not enough for now, but we should really talk about this uh, more in detail uh, to find uh, more opportunities uh, uh, together. Mm -hmm. I would be happy. But I'm great many of the faculty fam members from the Institute are watching because this was to set the uh, uh, ground previous work of several uh, faculty members uh, for the previous interest and com combined interest on, on a dedicated topic. Then we, uh, other pe people can watch it afterwards Then we will have set up another time for discussing what we can do in the future. I guess that's the plan as, as far as I understand. So we don't wanna, we will only know what each other we are doing in in, in group together. I, I didn't realize uh, Arda Hoja has to return, but I'm not sure what, what Birkan Hoja's situation is. Do you want to say a few words about how you are interested and what you have contributed within this team? Uh, Birkan Hoja, maybe for the record before. Okay. Oh. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, up to maybe uh, two years before, I was mostly dealing with more theoretical and simulation based work. Now, currently, I have some. Uh, testbed uh, related works, which are, I'm trying to mimic a, a circulatory network of the human body. And I am, I, my aim is mostly uh, to locate some uh, molecule X uh, emission point. So I will introduce some emission from a vein in the network and uh, from the sensors that are uh, capable of sensing that molecule X, I will get the response and I will do the sample localization. So this uh, project is continuing in 2232. Uh, this is the scope of uh, the, uh, my project, which is related to molecular communication and, uh, and we will uh, employ some uh, AI techniques and machine learning techniques to do some localization or in-body localization. Excellent. Uh, I don't see any further questions uh, from the audience. I want to ask a, a question. Is uh, Professor Tuju, if he is still available? Uh, one of the important uh, biophysical principles of communication in biology is having refractory periods on the receiving side. Have you considered that refractory periods? So instead of once you reach a certain peak, the receiver went to, into a non-receiving mode for a certain duration of time. Yeah. Then it says, uh, then, then essentially you don't get the background signal anymore. If you're still above that threshold, when the, when the receiver comes out of the refractory period, then you, you either count the amplitude or you'd count it as a, another signal of transmission. That's utilized a lot in uh, receptor signaling or in nerve transmission, or even, I mean, any action potential of nerves. Is, is there any, any thought that it could be applied to your theoretical framework? Uh, sure. Uh, this actually helps uh, automatically. Uh, control the uh, amount of uh, interceptable interference uh, slightly, but it also reduces uh, the data rate. Uh, currently, now, uh, if you just uh, work theoretically, you can do anything, of course, but uh, if you uh, look at the real numbers from the biology world, uh, you see that, for example, if you're uh, making use of uh, proteins, uh, if you're synthesizing uh, proteins, then it takes a lot of time. Uh, so things are really running very slow at the moment. So 
uh, this compensates for that reflecting time. But uh, we're looking into ways of how we can make things a little bit faster because we would like to transmit a little bit uh, at higher capacity. But uh, as communication engineers, our point is mostly finding the capacity. What's the maximum capacity? What's the maximum data rate at which you can transmit? So we're interested in how you can transmit. And once you do it, what's the maximum data rate that you can transmit? But you write uh, the, uh, after uh, the receiver has received something, there is some relaxation time uh, until which you cannot receive that, uh, you cannot receive a new uh, symbol. But we're, we're considering that. Uh, that's one of the important uh, limiting factors, I would say, uh, the data rate, for the data rate, correct. So what's the order of magnitude for the available data rate? Do you think I jumped in? Sorry about that. Uh, okay. Or I guess you have the every right to jump in. As the big boss, <laughs> go ahead, jump in anytime. Take it over. Great. Uh, the time, as I said, if you're making use of proteins, uh, it goes as bad as uh, 20 to 30 minutes. Which is extremely slow. Mm -hmm. uh, when you make use of calcium signaling, for example, it becomes uh, less than a second. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you look at the neurons, of course, it's much, much faster, but then tempering with the neurons, that is quite difficult. I mean, you cannot temper with the uh, neuromuscular junction, for example, or, or uh, the uh, synaptic cleft. Uh, so, uh, looking at what type of molecules you're using, uh, it differs. As Birkano just said, uh, the distance is quite imp uh, important. But uh, if you uh, just if you're just based on simple uh, diffusion uh, without any flow or anything else, uh, then the distance is extremely low. That's also one limiting factor. Uh, so that's why we are looking at things like what happens inside a vessel, because in that case, uh, your communication range and also uh, the, the transmission time improve. Mm -hmm. Also here, maybe uh, I can add uh, the important thing, is another dimension is uh, energy consumption. So mm -hmm. uh, compared to electromagnetic case, the energy consumptions are very low. I mean, if you consider bit per energy, uh, molecular communication is a good way to go. We are talking about zip to juice and transmitting a bit, for example. Great, yeah. Well, I can, there is a lot to digest and then... Uh, I mean, this is a certainly a fruitful discussion to be continued maybe as we look in the future, but let me add one more thing about the distances of the biology resolves. You know, there are big, big animals. I mean, we are also considered big. big. We, we, we transmit information over a meter, right? Through the axons. And we manage to do it in the fraction of a milliseconds by combining molecular tools with also field effects of what we are creating on the cells. So we reach, the, that means we do not wait all the way for the molecules to transmit meters, meters. We just create temporary disturbances of electrical field and axon physiology takes care of the rest and you will get the remote effect on those. Interesting ways of uh, combining some of this technology for remote communication can be combined. If you have a suitable carrier like axon, then you can transmit this information from one location in the body to another location in the body, whether you can tamper with nervous tissues is another question, but I mean, I mean, if crazy engineers and molecular biologists come together, then everything is possible, I guess. Yes, but one uh, other problem with the uh, case of neural network is you have to uh, do the communications only on the path of the uh, neurons. You don't, I mean, like, you have the uh, neural network working in specific, uh, specific directions and uh, between you know the brain and the specific muscle, but if you want to cross line, 
then uh, it doesn't work. But if, if that's your application, uh, like for the case of uh, using, uh, for example, uh, exoskeletons uh, or uh, synthetic limbs for the disabled people, it becomes quite important uh, to be able to receive that signal coming from the brain, move the limb accordingly, and uh, also if you can get the feeling sense, be able to transmit it uh, in a way that the brain will understand that, for example, you touch something so that you don't break it. We have to solve communication problem in different scales and biology has solved it within its limitation. Now we are, we are our engineer's task is now to learn some of these uh, tools and then maybe hopefully go over their limitations and do something better. That's always the scenario. But with biology in biology illy inspired solutions. Are there any parting words, Jan Hocam? Should we, this will continue until morning? I'm pretty sure, but I, I mean, this will introduce to wrap up and give the introduction to this to the team's overall coordinated effort. I know every every academicians have also have their own, but maybe additional students and uh, PhD students and master students, but their coordinated effort is uh, what has been presented here. And we will put the, some of these uh, videos and whatever the uh, academicians are willing to share uh, to a repository internally. And hopefully uh, we will share it uh, with Neurotech EU people at one point. This was a better trial of this first seminar, but hopefully next one will be more streamlined and more structured. Yeah, at least the floor is yours. Zoom. At least arrange the Zoom link to survive. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, it will take uh, further uh, thinking and discussing. We, we have been working with Wal Kambe. I think he, he may be here. I don't know if he is here. It would be good he to- He was introduce. here earlier. Hmm? Yeah, he was. Um, so actually we were um, on Friday with him. We had a session uh, of trying to put a block diagram of how bin, bin dirt would look like. And now we did that from the uh, aim targets going backward. So if, if we take one of the targets uh, to be these motion assistive devices, exoskeletons and uh, powered prosthesis and so forth, there, there are others too. And we came to a nice point. So I went back home very happy that day, uh, despite the fact that there are lots of unhappy uh, things happening around us. Um, so, it would be what I need to do is to put this back into that context and then share it with uh, with the group later on. Probably that would be a great uh, and maybe specify a few other questions uh, and then try to get to more concrete concrete uh, relationships between these tracks. That's where I am at actually. If Volcom Bay were here, it would have been great to introduce him to to the group too. But that can also be done later on, probably. Uh, I guess uh, I, maybe I should I should have also got in touch with him uh, earlier and let her speak few words. Uh, I missed him and also our daughter. But I mean, we'll continue uh, these lines uh, next for the uh, next three weeks at least for the academic counterparts. And maybe maybe maybe if we are lucky, we can then maybe include some industrial uh, components as well at one yeah. point or combine them with academic counterparts uh, to uh, within this uh, framework of combining what we have cooking in-house in within our larger group uh, just to get to know each other 